Okay, do you have your Halloween costumes picked out yet? It's almost here, constant listeners, just over a week away. Sort of a strange holiday for me, at least, but if it's your thing, enjoy it. In this time of year, however, it's also a time where we've got baseball playoffs. And that leads us into our dedication for episode 74 of The Far Middle. This is Nick Deolius. Good to be with you. I could easily have gone with football and the great Bob Lilly, uh, Mr. Cowboy. You know, but we've been on a, a football run of late, and I suspect that may continue when I ponder some episodes coming up. Uh, with their dedications. So I want to dedicate 74 to the sport of baseball. More specifically, four things of note that occurred in the 1974 season for 74 uh, that occurred on a diamond of the major leagues. So what's the first thing that occurred in 1974 when it comes to baseball? Well, the first accomplishment of note pertains to one of my all-time favorites in all of baseball, a gentleman who was also an epic thief. What, What are you talking about? gentleman and a thief. Well, the player that I'm speaking of is Lou Brock. And in 74, Brock set the season record for stolen bases at 118. That stood until a guy named Henderson broke it. Uh, Lou Brock just loved him as a player. 3,000 hit club, 938 stolen bases, a career record uh, when he called it quits and retired. And the other thing about Brock that people don't appreciate, he was a clutch performer. 391 World Series batting average, that's the highest for anyone who played over 20 World Series games. Had 14 stolen bases in World Series play, that's also a record. And he had 13 hits in the 1968 World Series, which tied a single season record. As I said, he was clutch and, of course, a first ballot Hall of Famer. Now, the second accomplishment of note in 74 in baseball, that 1974 season, it's one everybody knows about regarding another true gentleman of the game. And that is Hammer and Hank, who bested the Babe's career home run mark. 715 for Marin, it beat 714 for Ruth in 1974. And Hank beat the death threats and the race baiters and so on as well, not just the home run record. So people my generation, they think of Hank Aaron as a home run hitter, and it's easy to see why. And younger generations, they don't even have a clue as to the extent of his greatness. But Aaron may have been the best all-around baseball player of all time. He was the all-time leader in total bases. He had, here's an interesting statistic for you to ponder. He had 3,000 hits, even when you don't count his 755 home runs. Just think about that. Of course, he's in a 500 home run club, home run king, and still the king, by the way, when it comes to career home runs, if you want those kings to be without any asterisks or PEDs attached to them. Uh, He was a gold lover in the field, very consistent. He had 40 home runs in eight seasons. And he had longevity when you looked at his career, played in uh, almost 3,330 games. So just a a really long career. Now, the third accomplishment in 74. Technically, this one was announced after the close of the 74 season. So in calendar year 1974, and it didn't take effect until the start of the 1975 season. But it was important, and it was set into action in 1974 right around this time of year, actually. And that was Frank Robinson. So not exactly the typical gentleman like Heron and uh, and Lou Brock, because Frank Robinson could be quite surly and intimidating. But Frank Robinson was named the manager of the Indians and thus became the first black manager in the major leagues. He was actually a player manager when he started as skipper. Um, I don't know how good or bad of a manager he was, but I can tell you if Frank Robinson told me to do something and I'm a player, I would respond with a quick yes, sir and get on with doing it. Uh, Frank Robinson, in my book, and I'm going to be careful what my words are, I think he is the most underrated great player in Major League history. So think about that, the most underrated of the greats. So everyone, of course, puts him in with the greats, but his level of greatness, it's underestimated, it's underrated, which is strange in a way, because the guy had almost 3,000 hits. He fell just shy of the 3,000 hit mark. Um, 500 career home runs, so he's in a 500 plus uh, career home run, so he's in a 500 home run club. Won the triple crown, um, two time MVP, one in each league, so he won one with the Reds and won another one with the Orioles. A Gold Glover, Manager of the Year, so I guess he wasn't all that bad of a manager when he became skipper, and a World Series MVP. Um, greatness that should not be discounted, constant listeners, when it comes to Frank Robinson. And then the fourth and the final, the last item of note from the 74 baseball season, a little bit different than the first three that I just discussed. This happened on June 4th, 1974. Um, Location was in Cleveland, Cleveland Municipal Stadium. 
The Rangers were playing the Indians, and both teams had brawled on the field, and the Indians ended up getting into it with fans in Arlington in Texas a week prior. So there was a, a lot of bad blood between these two teams going into their series in Cleveland. And Billy Martin, who was just a, a outright sheer lover of fighting, um, he was the Rangers manager, and he said he wasn't worried about going to Cleveland the next week after that uh, first brawl ensued in Texas because he said no fans would probably be at the game anyway. So he took a shot at Cleveland and their fans. So he, he sort of riled things up and poked the bear um, going into Municipal Stadium before the series. And then there was a promotion that night uh, that the front office with the Indians decided would be a good idea on June 4th. And what was the promotion? The promotion was 10 cent beer night. Now, what in the world could possibly go wrong, right? The game was intense. Um, the fans were fighti uh, fighting, and they were lighting off firecrackers and hurling everything from food to spit to an empty gallon jug of Thunderbird booze at the Rangers. And by the seventh inning of this game, you know the families and the few sober fans that were there, they left the ballpark. They were gone. And the remaining crowd, it continued to grow more drunk and more drunk as time went on. Uh, there was a sports writer at the time. His name was Paul Jackson. He described what he saw in a 2008 article on the event 10 Cent Beer Night. He said, early on, the demand for beer surpassed the Indians' capacity to ferry it to the concession stands. And the luminary, perhaps the same person who suggested the promotion in the first place, decided to allow fans to line up behind the outfield fences and have their cups filled directly from Stroh's company trucks. The promotion achieved critical mass at that moment, is weaving, hooting cues of people refilled via industrial spigot. It's a great description of what ensued and how things unfolded. After the uh, the Indians had managed to tie the game late, a fan ran onto the field, tempted to steal uh, a Texas Rangers outfielder. His name was Jeff Bros at the time, if you guys remember Jeff Bros, his hat, his cap, and thinking that um, Burroughs had been attacked, Texas manager Billy Martin, the pugnacious one, he looked at his team in the dugout, and he said, let's go get them, boys. And they charged onto the field with the players, his players, Billy Martin's players right behind them. Some of them were wielding bats. Um, a large number of drunk fans, some of them armed with knives and chains and clubs uh, that were fashioned from portions of the stadium seats that they tore apart. They surged onto the field and all kinds of other fans were throwing bottles and everything else from the stands. 200 fans surrounded the, I don't know, two dozen Texas Rangers or so. More fans coming at them. The Indians players, they tried to help the Rangers. They were soon attacked by the mob as well. Um, both teams ended up fighting their way to the clubhouse, barricaded the doors, and then the drunks proceeded to completely trash the stadium. Thus, you had the legend of 10 Cent Beer Night. It was born. Um, the best quote about someone there that night was from actually Tim Russert of Meet the Press fame. Um, he was in college at the time, and he was at that game in 74. Someone asked him what he recalled of the event, and his response was, hey, I had two bucks in my pocket when I went in. You do the math. So episode 74 goes to 1974 in baseball. Lou Brock set a stolen base record. Hammer Hank, he beats the babe. Frank Robinson becomes the first black manager, and 10 Cent Beer Night on the shores of Lake Erie uh, create a legendary event uh, not to be repeated. Whew, all right, so with all that behind us, let's get moving on connecting those dots. 1974 baseball milestones. Well, you know, during the 1970s, including in 74, the country was experiencing horrible inflation and an energy crisis or energy crises. Does it sound familiar? It should because history is repeating itself, of course, in 2022. Everybody knows that except for our elected leaders. We had President Biden who was asked in mid-September if he was worried about inflation in those August numbers that were then just released, he said he wasn't worried. And using his words, he wasn't worried because we're talking about one-tenth of one percent. That's what he said. Well, actually, he was looking at an 8.3 percent year-over-year increase in the CPI, but who's checking? Not the media, for sure. They're not checking. And in late summer, uh, families were spending 24 percent more for energy than they did a year prior, 6 percent more for housing. 11% more for food. Those are serious and troubling numbers. President Biden was also bragging at gas prices. They were down $1.30 a gallon since the start of summer. But what he failed to mention, and those astute journalists failed to pick this up or report it, 
that those gas prices are still up a buck thirty a gallon since President Biden took office. But I guess that's due to Putin and corporate greed, right? It's surely not due to energy policy and that vaunted energy transition. On the uh, the food front, it's getting ugly. Uh, grocery prices, they saw the biggest year-on-year jump since those 1970s. But the president, he got some help from Speaker Pelosi. She said, and I'm not making this up, constant listeners, that the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, was a landmark law that's driving down costs for kitchen table items for Americans. You got to be kidding me. Um, meat and eggs, they're up almost 11% in prices. Dairy's up 16%. Um, fruit and veggies, or if in case of veggies, what Dr. Oz calls crudity, uh, they're up over 9%. I'm still shocked about how these D.C. leaders, they claim blatantly false achievements. And nobody in the profession that was once called journalism does the most basic of fact-checking on it. Very frustrating. But, you know, I expect the, uh, the you-know-what show is going to continue on for some time. But, you know, maybe perhaps we should count our blessings here stateside because things including inflation and energy security, they are way worse in Europe because of energy and climate policies of the EU enabling the Putins of the world and creating the unreliability of the grid that is now leaning on shaky wind and solar. So now that the grid can't perform as needed, there's not natural gas, right, to be found once Putin shut those valves on the pipelines in the economies of the continent and the UK, what's happened to them? They're crumbling. The bureaucrats and the academics and the politicians that set all this into motion and are the true root causes, what are they doing? They're doubling down in desperation and enacting measures that will 100% certainly make the situation worse. It's guaranteed it will make the situation worse. So the European Commission president, she is calling for energy firms to give $140 billion to the users of power. She said, quote, in these times, it's wrong to receive extraordinary record revenues and profits benefiting from war and on the back of our consumers, end quote. That's not going to help. That's not going to fix the root problem. And that's going to make matters worse. It's an indirect price cap. And that's been proven failure for decades in modern economies. I've said it before, but maybe it bears mentioning again. EU energy and climate policy set by those adhering to an ideology and having no clue as to how energy infrastructure really works in the real world. They set the grid to a state of instability. They created a reliance on Putin. Putin took advantage of that leverage and invaded the Ukraine. That created more unreliability, more energy scarcity, more inflation. The incompetency of the EU elite, they're the root causes of the mess afflicting Europe, and they're going to be the root causes of our developing messes here in the United States if their policies continue to march on. The elite and their policies, they've been exposed across continents now, whether it's over here in North America or over there in Europe. Them doubling down on the smoke screens and the gimmicks and the sound bites, that's not going to cover up a worsening situation. It is way too late in the game for that. And by the way, it is ironic and maddening to see somebody like the European Commission president say that when that's exactly what she and her colleagues did to consumers by mandating and subsidizing and protecting unreliable and expensive wind, solar, and EVs. Now, that EU flavor of ineptitude sort of reminds me of another connection. Another bungling of a big moment by the elite was pandemic and those draconian shutdowns. Education was wasted. Deficits have ballooned. Um, public transportation, it's now a financial money trap with no ridership. Um, work ethic, we talked about how that was eroded. And then businesses in the services sector, they were just completely devastated and often destroyed. And the damage is still emerging years after the start of the COVID pandemic in China or Wuhan. And we talk of commercial and office real estate in big cities in prior episodes. We saw another statistic that is surprising and alarming that I wanted to share with you guys on this episode. The Partnership for New York City conducted a survey recently of major Manhattan office employers. And the survey returned some shocking results. 49% of office workers are at the office on an average workday in Manhattan. So that's less than half of the office workers' constant listeners. In April of this year, it was only 38%, so it actually got a little better. And just 9%, 9% of office workers are in the office five days a week in Manhattan. Th those statistics are shocking. Now, what's that say about work ethic and about productivity and about culture of the workplace? And again, public transportation's future. 
and revenues for restaurants and other services on the island of Manhattan. Well, what's it say about the prospects for commercial real estate moving forward? To quote Neil Young, you know, the damage done and still being done, not because of pandemic, but because of the management of pandemic by those in power. Oh, and that you know brings me to another dot. New York City's budget and tax revenues, how are they doing post-pandemic shutdowns? Not good if you look below the headline numbers. The New York Post, that's one of my favorite papers. That's right, you pretentious snob, if you read the New York Times and look down on the Post. But the New York Post reported the highest recorded number of New Yorkers who switched their driver's license from New York State to Florida for a single month, almost 6,000 people in the month of August. Year to date, uh, that number, by the way, is almost 42,000 New Yorkers who said adios to the Empire State and its leftist policies and headed south on I-95. Looks like, if you prorate this out, the 2022 is going to set an annual record. People have had enough, and New York's tax revenues and fiscal health, they're going to start showing it. Um, Things are going to get worse in the Big Apple, I fear. Escape from New York, that's a great film, of course, by John Carpenter from the early 1980s. It's evolving from a big screen fictional account to real world reality. Okay, let, let's shift now to connect to a, a topic that's serious that I wanted to, to cover and, and talk about for some time. So I look around, I see what's happening, whether it's the EU, the US, um, New York, uh, what's going on in my home region of Western Pennsylvania. It's easy for me, and I often get disheartened, and I start to think or ask myself are we, society, civilization, are we hardwired for destruction? Is the risk to our civilization or to our nation, is it an external risk that we should be worried about? Is it pandemics or war, something like those things? And, you know, we've seen, of course, enough of those these days, right? Now, I think the American genius, Will Durant, he nailed it when he observed that a great civilization, it's not conquered from without until it has been destroyed by itself from within. And the external issue, yeah, that can be the straw that breaks the already weakened camel's back, but the root causes were wrought from within the civilization itself. So I did some thinking, and I wanted to share with you some takeaways from the noted writer Sir John Glubb, who published the essay, The Fate of Empires and Search for Survival. Give that essay a read. It's an excellent read if you get a chance. Glubb, he subscribed to the view that civilizations were sort of akin to organisms, Um, that were hatched, they grew, and then they receded into basically a a death spiral. And he laid out a sequence of stages in the life cycle of the great societies or the great civilizations. And think about these stages in our national journey since 1776 as I walk you through. So the first stage, as Glubb described it, was the age of the pioneer. And this is where explorers and innovators, they achieve great things, albeit at times in less than optimal ways in hindsight. So you look back and maybe not the most perfect ways or, or with some regrets, but they achieved great things. So this you know, sort of reminds you of like the Lewis and Clarks, the founding fathers, um, the industrial revolution when it comes to the United States. But then after the age of the pioneer, next comes the age of commerce. This is where great cities rise up. Um, The arts, they're created, they're built and fed by the wealth of commerce. Capitalism creates um, value and wealth, and it's a tide that ends up raising all ships. And this is sort of the high watermark for the society or the civilization. The wealth it creates, however, also plants the seeds of a potential and ultimate collapse. So sort of some of our looming or to be seen problems into the future, they start to, to germinate during this period. I think of the Gilded Age and the robber barons and sort of you know, the country's identity in place over the two world wars, World War I and, and II there in the early 1900s. Sort of reminds you of that, those periods of time, right? Then comes the age of affluence. So here money becomes the end-all, be-all, not achievement. Um, society becomes spoiled, starts to rot. Entitlements abound to everyone and the slightest hardships. They'd collapse the civilization without state support. A welfare state starts to boom. How's it paid for? It's paid for by appropriating the wealth of doers and creators. Um, Personal responsibility starts to evaporate. And just to give you a sort of context, at the height of the Roman Empire, one out of three citizens were on the state dole in some way, shape, or form. Um, Then its decline came, of course, for the Roman Empire. Does that remind you of the West and America in 2022? Or even more frighteningly, does it remind you of America 30 years ago, and now we're in the next phase of the life cycle. Because the next phase 
is the age of intellect, as Glubb sees it. Um, religion is killed. You tear down values and objective truth. And what do the elite replace it with? They replace it with your truth and my truth. Society becomes value free. Hmm. Sounds like any campus you might stumble upon these days in America. And then the final and last stage of civilization, as defined by Glubb in his essay, it's the age of decadence. Uh, moral decay, you see it everywhere, um, as is mental illness. That's very prevalent across the civilization. Addiction to substances abound. Um, no one can separate truth from falsity. Virtues become vices, and the flip side is also true. Vices become virtues. Society can't endure its evils, but it also can't endure the remedies to getting away from the evils. So it's basically stuck in a death trap. I'm really worried, constant listeners. Uh, I want to be positive and optimistic about the human condition and the idea, the concept of America. But you think over these phases of a civilization laid out by Glubb, you can't help but feel we are sitting in one of the final two stages and in terminal decline. And perhaps our larger cities are, in fact, in the final stage of decadence, while the rest of the nation is maybe teetering in the age of intellect. I don't know. I hope I'm wrong, and I won't stop doing my part in fighting any decline, real or perceived. You do the same. Engage in that public discourse. Uh, there's always time for that. All right, I, I need to snap out of this. Focus on the positive, right? Let's do so, focusing on the positive, by jumping to our next connection. And I admit that I'm a skeptic of religion, or maybe more specifically, the leaders or the institutions of religion. Whenever you're misappropriating morals and ideals for personal and institutional gain and power, th those aren't good things. And you see that a lot with religion in the Mideast. Um, you see it a lot with the Vatican in Rome. I wrote a chapter in my book, Precipice, on what's going on in Rome. Give that chapter a read if you get a chance. But sometimes, sometimes there is a leader within a religion that truly inspires for me, the biggest example of that was Pope John Paul II, as a young Catholic, you know, very impactful to me. But through the years, I came across another individual who sort of became a, a bit of a shining light, on albeit a smaller scale, but still a national level uh, compared to what you know, Pope John Paul II had done. Now, this individual's name was Reverend Ike, and he was centered in New York City. So Reverend Ike's sermons and talks and interviews, they're all preserved on YouTube. You can check them out at your leisure. His radio and TV broadcasts reached millions of listeners. At his height, he had over 1,700 TV and radio stations that broadcast them. And his following was largely African-American. His message was, yeah, it was religious, but it was also quintessentially American. And he would sort of take the view that, you know, God's on your side. Um, if you can believe in that and you can claim that, you can go achieve things and you want to go achieve, and you know God wants you to be successful and to achieve as well. So a little bit of a different sort of position or message with the type of, uh, of religion or the type of God he was preaching about. He didn't apologize, Reverend Ike didn't, for success or for financial gain. He desired it for his listeners, and he desired it for himself. He lived quite large. Uh, he had large homes, as in plural. He had fancy cars, lots of them, and he did and lived like this all in the open. His view was that, hey, God wants you to be successful in this life, not miserable in this life until you receive your just reward after you're dead. So don't rely on anybody, an institution, the government, whatever, whoever, to save you. Go save yourself and go achieve on your own behalf. So you listen um, to Reverend Dyke, and you sense a little bit of evangelical. Um, you sense some self-help. There's like a self-help component to this. And you don't just sense, but you're presented with just an outright capitalist, um, some positivity in there, capitalism being a good thing, um, how self-interest, right, that's, that's great, that serves you, the individual, and that's not only okay, but that's morally right to want and to achieve success for yourself. So for myself, a Catholic trained in my youth about you know, things like original sin and the evils of success and, and money, it's sort of disorienting to hear that, but also enjoyable to listen to the views of Reverend Dyke. And lots of people, especially especially the establishment and religion and the media, they did not like Reverend Dyke. And they took it to him, went after him every chance they got, including after his death. And I get why a lot of people might be skeptical or not like him. You know, he was sort of part preacher, but he was also part promoter, no doubt about it. Maybe even part economist, I don't know. 
But no matter what your view, um, the reverend had a message that inspired millions of people. And did he profit from it? He certainly did. But he also inspired with it, inevitably changed lives for the better. Okay, so it is um, closing time for episode 74. And that's borrowing a phrase shouted out from countless bars tonight at 2 a.m. in the Steel City. And also the title of a 1998 hit song from Semisonic, if you remember that one. Hey, here is some advice for you, by the way. I, I've got this straight from the mouth of a, a bar owner himself. Nothing good happens in bars after 10 p.m. So that was given to me as advice years ago from that individual. I think that uh, that's been proven to be true, at least from my observations. And I will wrap with a classic far middle connection. You know, we started the episode talking baseball in the year 1974. Um, we just left a discussion of Reverend Ike. Um, I told you he had millions of listeners in the 1970s. Um, one of them, believe it or not, was John Lennon, as in the Beatle John Lennon, when he lived in New York City. And one evening when he was listening to the Reverend, he heard Ike say something along the lines of, you know, do this or that whatever, to get you through the night. And Lennon thought, hey, that would be a great song lyric. Before you knew it, John Lennon wrote the single, Whatever Gets You Through the Night, and he released it in 1974. That year, I guess, can serve as the alpha and the omega for this episode. I hope you get through the week, constant listeners, and we will convene soon for episode 75.